Okay, so um, I'm Tom Leggett. I'm an engineering manager up at Hewlett Packard in Filton. Um, I work on our enterprise cloud offering. Um, so, just so I've got an idea about who I'm talking to, how many of you use Agile in your day job at the moment? Yeah, good. Um, how many of you work for a, like a large enterprise, say several thousand people or more? Smaller, medium sized businesses, startups? I know most, most, well, you're all in tech, you're a Chris Tech. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk to you about why I think the dogma that we're currently sold, which is that you should all be using Agile <coughs> to develop your software, is wrong and dangerous. Um, and I'm going to give you three concrete ideas about how you can work out what, what a way of working that is appropriate for you, um, for your business and for your team. Um, I'm going to give you one that has come out of HP. Um, I'm going to give you, uh, and that's based on a paper that was published a couple of years ago um, called Do You Need a New Product Development Strategy? I'm going to talk about um, the my favourite incarnation of value stream mapping called Wardy Mapping, which is widely used in uh, UK government public sector projects. And I'm going to talk to you about something called Kinevin, which is widely used, more widely used in overseas government projects, particularly in uh, the Far East, and there's some nice case studies out of Singapore. And I'm going to get my notes as well. But first of all, I'm going to talk to you about um, why I'm an engineering manager now, and not an engineer, because I, as seven years ago, seven, eight years ago, I had an engineering job, um, software engineering job for a great company working on... Um, so I, I love music, it's my, it's my hobby, I love listening to music, I love playing music. Um, and I was working for a company that was selling music, which was great. Um, and I was doing technology as well. Um, so why did I give that up and go into management, which for all the extra money you get is, is absolutely thankless, um, frequently depressing and um, uh, horrible job. <laughs> Any other managers in the room? <laughs> Good, don't. <laughs> um, so, it came, uh, so prior to um, having this, this wonderful job that I love for selling music, um, I had worked at lots of, lots of small startups. And they, had, uh, they were 10 person teams, maybe at most, mostly staff with fresh grads like myself out of university. I arrived at Nokia um, at the time, and there were 200 uh, engineers working on this product. They were 200, to talk to individually, 200 of the most experienced, um, enthusiastic, well-paid engineers with extremely expensive workstations and 30-inch monitors and so on. Um, completely the opposite from my startup experience. But that team of 200 experienced, well-funded, well-resourced devs were getting, um, in terms of the product that they were able to deliver to the market, were getting beaten up by 10-person startups all over the place. So I had a, a, a kind of epiphany that it's not just about having the best engineers and the most well-resourced teams and uh, all, everything that you need. It's also about getting a good product out to the market and making an, making an impact. It's also about how you organize the work and how you organize the teams and how the teams are run. And the money helped. Um, so I'm going to talk to you, I told you I'm going to talk to you about um, so these slides are all available online, there's a couple of links along the way if you want to do more reading. I really encourage you to go and um, read some of these links, there's way more detail than I'm going to be able to cover in, um, in 10 minutes each. Um, so, so please go and have a read. Um, so, do you need a new product development strategy? This uh, is a paper published in 2012 that came out of a series, came out of HP screwing up the internet royally. We, we dropped the ball on the internet. Big time, you missed it. Um, and fair play to them, they realised they'd made a mistake and they formed an internal group that was going to make sure that they didn't, that this didn't happen again. An internal consulting group that would um, <coughs> consult with all of the different product development efforts going on around the company, um, interview, you know, this is a company of 200,000 people at the time, interview the various different product managers, engineers, um, business units. 
and find out what was going on, what went wrong with, the, with HP's approach to the internet and how they could avoid making those mistakes again. So through the course of this research, they interviewed 500 different, they, they interviewed 500 different projects um, and they noticed, so before I go into details on what they found, does anyone recognize the, the can anyone see the diagram on the, on the wall? Sorry, it's a bit small. This is Gartner's hype cycle, right? So you, you start off with emerging technology um, at day zero, you get to the peak of inflated expectations, which is probably about where Docker's getting to at the moment. You slide down to the trough of dis disillusionment um, before, before you start to climb the slope of, uh, of enlightenment and mass market adoption. So this is more, the, the, the uh, vertical axis is more about um, hype or expectations than market size. There's actually a really large market at the, at the tail end, much larger market at the tail end of this, of this cycle. So what the HP folks noticed is that you need, um, in the, the successful projects in HP were, had different operating models depending on which part of the hype cycle they were working on. Seems obvious, right? At the time, this was, this, this was at a time in sort of late 90s, early 2000s of centralized PMOs and, and Prince 2 Agile really hadn't broken through yet. So um, everyone did phase data development, everyone did their, um, got their requirements signed off, at least a bit requirements document, they got their requirements signed off with, you know, the waterfall, classic waterfall. Um, so, HP looked at the looked at the um, sorry, I'm lost. Yes, HP looked at the different styles of development that they had and the projects that they had ongoing, and they split up. <coughs> and, and bearing in mind, sort of the early, early 2000s, this research started, so in 2012, um, they split up their um, projects into three kind of styles of development. They, which they classified as startup, which was cloud at the time. Uh, cloud is the, the exemplar of the startup um, type. Growth, which at the time was blades, uh, blade servers, and maturity or commodity, which at the time was uh, desktops. Um, and they identified a number of different criteria. And the form I mentioned, wrong order. Um, <laughs> They, they identified a number of different questions or criteria for each phase. So the key question you're trying to answer in the startup is, in the startup phase, is does a market exist? Uh, does a mark specifically does a market exist for us? So Amazon may have proved that cloud is a viable market and that people are willing to give Amazon money for cloud, but does a market exist for HP? Are people willing to give HP money for cloud? Didn't know. Um, in the growth mindset or the growth style, um, how the, uh, the, que the key question is how quickly can we adapt to uh, customers changing needs? And in the maturity phase, it's how can we sustain margin and scale? So uh, it's about more about efficiency. So answering unknowns, responding to change, and efficiency and effectiveness. Um, customers, startup phase lead users and enthusiasts, um, early majority in growth phase and late majority and laggards in the maturity phase. Um, customer needs are largely unknown in the startup phase, changing rapidly in the growth phase and well known and stable in the maturity phase. I already talked about this a bit. Um, the market's very small, potentially non-existent in the startup phase, and very large, but lots of competition in the uh, maturity phase. I, I'm going to skip some of these. Um, technology maturity speaks for itself. Uh, now, this is important. In the startup phase, what the successful teams were doing was lots of concurrent prototypes out to the market, low cost, rapid iteration on many ideas at once. 
in the growth phase, they've narrowed it down to one or two competing ideas and iterated on those ideas. And in the maturity phase, it was really one dominant technology platform that was being <coughs> iterated and, and refined. Um, and they also had some pretty good data on requirements. Um, in the startup phase, they uh, before they before the project started, they knew about 20% of the parameters of how the product ended up. Uh, and in the maturity phase, they were able to say with kind of a 90% confidence before the project started uh, what the requirements were going to be when the project finished. So, with these different um, contexts for the different projects, it makes sense that different. Um, different development styles would be more optimal for the different um, for the different for the different styles. So they compiled three different um, styles of engineering, if you like. They documented them and they organised their teams. Uh, they organised their organisations around these three different styles. So their labs organisation would be driving the startup. Um, type uh, businesses and projects. Then they had emerging divisions that would drive the growth markets, and they had stable divisions that would that would drive the um, the mature markets. Today, the um, the styles would be would look like a lean startup. Has, has anybody read the lean startup book? Eric Rice. Um, would look very much like Lean Startup, lots of concurrent experiments, lightweight, not committing, um, not making any decisions that will lock you in too early. The growth phase looks like the agile that we know and love, the, the rapid iteration on a small number of ideas um, and bringing your customers close. And the maturity actually looks like a waterfall project, right? Because it was about efficiency and predictability, and meeting schedules and meeting costs. Um, positions within an industry is important as well. This was another realization that they made when they started to look at how uh, how, how companies outside of HP did their product development. Um, an example they looked at was Toyota versus Tesla um, developing electric cars. Uh, and whilst Tesla were able to iterate, were able to produce very rapidly something for a very small market with a with a small team small but high margin market. Toyota were um, developing um, much longer, much more concrete um, products. For example, they had a team solely dedicated to what sound the car was going to make. Tesla didn't care what sound the car was going to make. They brought, they brought the um, customers closer and developed a, a car that was going to satisfy their target niche of, of sports car enthusiasts. So you, need to not, so you need to look at your position within, your company's position within the industry to, to influence your development style as well. Um, so ultimately, they suggest that you have four steps for defining the development styles that are going to be appropriate for your organization. You define and look at the business context, and there's tons more detail in the paper about how to actually do this. I don't, haven't got long enough to talk about it. Define the business context. Um, select and define the development styles and then monitor and review over time. Okay, that was the HP experience. We're going to talk um, now about something called Wardley mapping. Uh, it's been developed over the last decade or so by a guy called Simon Wardley. Um, he works in government, he works as an advisor to government IT projects at the moment, large government IT projects. Um, but he was, has been involved in the cloud industry um, for a long time. I like this because it provides some concrete advice about how to go about evaluating your business context. The HP stuff is very interesting, but it's a bit wishy-washy. It doesn't really tell you how to go about... It tells you that you need to be aware of your business context and that you need to flex your development style based on what your context is. It doesn't tell you how to do it. This stuff gives you some... Um, some concrete things that you can do. So he, he uh, 
For Simon, for Mr Wardley, it's all about situational awareness. And he will have us draw a value chain or a strategic map. He called a strategy map or a Wardley map. And funnily enough, we start with customer needs. Um, so I have very quickly thrown, so don't worry too much if you can't read this. I've, I've very quickly thrown together something for the cloud industry, right? Uh, for, for my product, which is selling um, enterprise software enterprise cloud um, software into big companies. Um, so the primary need is for our customers is application hosting. They want to host their, their internal and external applications. Um, they, the secondary needs then are um, storage, security, they want it to be secure, self-healing, um, alerting, databases of services when we hear from our customers quite often. They want to be able to deploy it, they want to be able to scale it, elastically and they want high availability they want to not fall over. The, these are just the initially presenting things. So once you've analysed your initial and your secondary customer needs, you can start to look at what you need to be able to fulfil those needs. Um, so for example for store, to fulfil the storage you need you need disks and you need servers. And for servers and disks, you need a data center. And for a data center, you need power and cooling. So you can start to break down what you are going to need to provide or acquire in order to serve the presenting customer needs. So this is a bit of a naughty example, but hopefully you get the idea. What, he'll, what, what you then do is you plot those customer needs over a, um, an evolution time frame. So his argument is that technologies evolve from genesis through custom built, through to a product, through to a commodity or a utility. Um, so picking power, which is at a, already a utility, I think we can all agree, but back at the turn of the century, uh, when power was uh, when power was still very much non-standardised, it would have been custom built per application. Uh, or, or sold as a product. So, in general, um, in general, technologies or components tend to move in this direction. You'll notice that these might be you might be able to map these onto the Gartner hype, hype cycle as well that we discussed earlier. His next argument is that. Um, Depending on where we are, on the where we put our phones on the left, or left to right, will influence what development style we should be using uh, in order to deliver. Right, so we wouldn't be doing custom-built power stations for our data centres. We would probably buy those from a utility. Um, but self-healing doesn't really exist as a product yet, and it's not always clear what that means. For um, legacy or line of business application, so that might be uh, that might be more in the genesis area. So he he overlays onto the onto the <coughs> evolution scale some advice about <coughs> what development styles you should use to deliver those components, um, saying that at this end, in the genesis end, you should be looking at agile and in-house. Um, in the middle, you should be looking at commercially commercially acquired off the shelf stuff, and um, in the commodity area you, you should be buying it from a utility or you should be outsourcing it. Okay. Um, so, Kenevin. Um, Kenevin Kenevin's a, a bit different the other two and that it doesn't offer concrete advice about um, development styles but it does offer you a useful framework for thinking about I think it offers you a useful framework for thinking about um, complexity how complex your thing how complex your thing is going to be this so um, Dave Snowden developed Kenevin over the last 20 years it's come out of um, come out of complexity sciences and natural sciences uh, and research into how complex systems behave. 
Um, and the framework looks a bit like this. I've got to go to see if I can find the notes on Um, so the, fr the framework looks a bit like this, um, and we're going to start in the bottom right corner, I'm going to go in a counterclockwise direction. Um, obvious, obvious stuff is simple stuff, this roughly maps to the kind of uh, utility area in the evolution scale. This is stuff that is obvious and simple. You could ask a, you could ask a child how to do it and you'd get a coherent answer. You can then move into the complicated, uh, sorry, the way you deal the way you deal with stuff in the simple area is that you categorize to be simple is that you, you look at it, you decide what sort of a thing it is, and you um, and then you deal with it. So if you want power, you look at it, you say this needs power, and you plug it in. Um, complicated is the domain of experts. Cause and effect still apply, but you're gonna need somebody who knows or has been trained what they're uh, trained in what they're doing in order to understand uh, things in this area. So there are constraints, things are tightly coupled, if you push something here, something else will fall off over there. So you really need somebody who knows, knows what they're doing. Uh, and here, sense, analyze, respond, which means look, think a bit, and then do something. Um, an example, might be, uh, I don't know, coding a web page, uh, coding a layout on a web page, um, or, or this presentation would be a web page. Um, look at it, think about it a bit, do some coding, maybe get it wrong, iterate, respond. If the, the complex area is the, most, is the most interesting to me. <coughs> and this is where, um, good practice doesn't necessarily apply because cause and effect have broken down a bit. Um, so we might be looking at large, thinking about large distributed systems here where um, where a code push that you've tested at a smaller scale um, and you push into your larger production system behaves in a completely unexpected way um, and keeps you up all night trying to bring it back to normality again. That's good from experience. Um, now the way to deal with things, the, the way they suggest you deal things, the way this framework suggests you deal with things in this area is that you probe, sense and respond. So you do something, you look at what effect that had on your system or your environment and then you respond to, um, to, to that effect. Things only make sense in retrospect in this area. This is roughly similar to the kind of emergent um, or startup area in HP's categorization, or the um, or the genesis area of Simon Wardley's maps. Um, chaotic is essentially random. You forget trying to predict anything. You want to get out of chaos as soon as possible. Um, and this is a cliff between chaotic and obvious. It's easy to go from obvious to chaotic if you have if your system is overly simple. Uh, but it's very hard to go from chaotic to obvious. You have to go uh, back around the other way. So where this is useful, where this is useful is in having conversations with your team and your stakeholders about how compli how complicated something is and deciding what approach to use. Right. So if you've got something that is obviously simple, then you can plan it and execute it much more efficiently than if you're going to have to plan for um, complicated or emergent behavior. Um, okay, so I've covered, I've covered three areas. I've tried to show some overlap between those areas. Um, and I've gone at quite a fast pace, I'm sorry. Um, so how do we, so, so what's missing? How do we tie this back into some concrete advice for your teams? Well, first of all, none of these things have really have anything to say about the teams themselves, which, are, which is, I think, where Agile really has um, some good strengths. Agile is very 
or, or agile methods are very team focused um, and they take into, they respect the people and the individuals that, that make up the team. Um, what's missing is concrete advice. All of these approaches are asking you to think about your business context and think about what <coughs> process is going to be most appropriate for you rather than blindly choosing uh, an out-of-the-box solution and applying it. Which kind of makes sense, right? You wouldn't um, blindly choose uh, an out-of-the-box solution for <coughs> technology. So why do, we, why do we feel that we have to do this for our process? Why are we all uh, slaves to Scrum and the iteration? We should be more uh, considerate about, <coughs> about the development processes you use. I'm afraid, so, uh, <laughs> so I'm, going, I'm going to leave it there and uh, open it up to questions and comments. So I'd like to understand, for example, why Waterfall is more appropriate for a more mature project. Because you're in a you're in a marketplace that is much more competitive, and your margins are much more tightly squeezed. And you can be more efficient in a, in a waterfall process. Really? I believe so. So in, you can, if you're doing a desktop rollout, right, let's say to thousands of desktops and you're rolling out um, the same, you're stamping out the same thing over and over again, there's a lot of overhead in Scrum in your two weekly, uh, in, your, in your planning sessions and your stand ups. And if you're comparing a team that's doing waterfall, versus a team that's doing scrum for something simple that you're stamping out over and over again, your water team is going to be able to be much more efficient with their use of resources. They can ramp up their team uh, and ramp down their team in scrum. No, 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 it's a fixed team. Fixed team size is seven plus or minus two people. You can be much more responsive to the phases and demands of your project. Just to finish this because that was that mm -hmm. um, is to say, for example, in a competitive environment, you can pass feedback to customers as key, which is something that Scrum Mega tries to trump. So is that a plus for going around the, the Scrum group as a principle for whereby you may not get feedback from some signal? I think this, the, yeah, that, that's a good point. I think this only makes sense as part of a portfolio of different approaches. You wouldn't want to be only doing waterfall in your company because if you were doing that then you would then you would have this completely uncoupled yourself from your customers and your ability to innovate I, I think the, the key realization the key finding from the HP study is that you need a you need a, a toolbox or a portfolio of approaches so for some projects waterfall will, will be acceptable and that should be okay you should be able to say that without being tarred and feathered is the implementation of this, uh, the results of this study, uh, why HP has been so successful and has been growing so much in the past? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no comment. So, yeah, we... I'm, I mean, it was actually a very serious question. Yeah, right? Is there yeah, actually yeah. any evidence that applying these strategies in this way brings, brings benefit? Because, I mean, there is a lot of evidence that, uh, you know, experimental evidence that Scrum seems to work in, in certain places. I wonder whether there's any... Yeah, there's, there's, there's anecdotal evidence that Scrum works in a lot of places. There's a lot of failed Scrum projects that you don't hear about yeah, as well. There's a lot, there's a lot yeah. of failed projects. <laughs> there's a lot of failed projects <laughs> full stop, uh, yeah. yeah. Which is, is I, I, I mean, I've so, just wondered whether, whether there's any evidential basis for... So the, the, HP, the HP looked at... Like I said, like I said, looked at 500 projects, and yeah, they were of varying, varying degrees of success. They, because of the people that were involved in doing the research, they tended to be the folks coming out of labs, so they were they were more focused at the genesis end of the spectrum. I think they had a, as a result, had a higher failure rate than you might expect. Um, 
think the reason some of us, there, there's no single cause for a, a big company like HP not doing so well in the marketplace. One of the reasons was that we were um, trying to standardize on a small number of, or, or on, on one development process for all, product, for all projects. And this paper was a reaction against that. So we went through a big, a big cost-cutting phase under Mark Hurd. Um, we tried to squeeze every last little bit of cost out of the business, and that had an impact on our ability to uh, try out different things or adopt different styles. It was all about centralization and control. That made us very fragile. Um, is it fair to say that it would be Scrum is not always the answer or Agile is not always the answer? I think Agile is not always the answer. Ag Agile, um, <coughs> Scrum, I'm going to get in trouble with you with the Agile folks now. <laughs> Scrum is a subset of Agile, right? Um, there are other Agile approaches. I don't think any of them would classify themselves as phase gates or waterfall. Uh, and I'm arguing that that is sometimes appropriate. Yeah, no, I just, I just find that people are negative about Agile, but what they mean is they're negative about Scrum. Scrum, particularly. And I just wonder what your experience was about. Uh, I... Uh, I've had some great teams running with Scrum. Uh, I, so I, I say Agile is not always the answer. It's often the answer, and almost always the answer, I would say, in most contexts. But it's difficult to say that these days without having zealots jump down your throat. Sorry. Um, a lot of the examples you've used are very much hardware-based. Uh, has there been any sign in software that this has also been a better way of looking at things in your experience? Uh, that's just unfortunate about the examples I've, unfortunate, unfortunate examples I've chosen. Most of this, uh, most of the data and research is based on software projects and all of my experiences in software projects, um, sometimes delivering into hardware programs. Mm. So yes, I'm I was wondering how you felt this related to developer satisfaction, because I think I'll agree with you that when you are sampling up the same thing over and over again, that probably is where waterfall um, comes into its own, but it also doesn't strike you as a kind of particularly enjoyable uh, kind of project to work on, and so I wonder if maybe the reason everyone's so keen on Agile and uh, kind of jumping down and jumping with you over that is because actually they want to do good fun projects and they don't want to do that. So do you agree that those kind of projects aren't, aren't quite so great for developers? Uh, yes, probably. Yeah. It depends on the developer, right? I know I know certain people who get a great kick out of working down a list and ticking off requirements. Mm. Um, so we should be respectful of that. Not everybody is an extrovert who wants to go out and chat with customers every day. <coughs> there are people who like to plan ahead and work through their work through their work list. Um. At the risk of being lynched, I probably agree with, with what you've said, coming from a large engineering organisation, but um, kind of related, if you have a project that is going from something like cloud, where you've got it in the startup phase, and then you're eventually moving through to a, a much more mature project, so you're maybe moving from mm -hmm. an agile approach to a more waterfall-based approach, how do you transition the team that's working on that project? Because you've got all your expertise, all your expert that's guys, a, that's, a great, start, like, that's a great question. It's, that's actually the point that, in, in the HP study, that was the biggest failure point for the projects that they looked at, was when they needed to transition from uh, one style of development to another. Um, what, what the HP folks found was that it was most often the management, and the middle management, that were the impediments to change, the inertia they called it. So they suggested, um, so they set up they, they set up the different divisions and they would move teams between, they would move the engineering teams between the divisions under different management structures. That's one way of doing it. But o overcoming that kind of inertia, overcoming that resistance to change, it's tough. There's no easy answer. Do you want different people doing that? I mean, you said there are people who are more suited to the mature phase and people more suited to the genesis phase. Would you be looking to discard your experts to get people more interested in a different phase? Yeah, I think you could. Um, what, so the way, the way HP does technology transfer out of its labs 
is that they have the <coughs> folks who did the um, technology development go work with the business unit, physically co-located with the business <coughs> unit for a short amount of time, and then move them back into labs and start them off on the next project. Oh yeah, over there, sorry. What are your strategies for getting out of the chaotic state? <laughs> strategies for getting out of the chaotic state. Um, try, try multiple things. Be prepared to um, act fast when things look like they're heading in the right direction. Um, not get into the chaotic state in the first place. Um, some people use some people deliberately use it's called a shallow it's called a shallow dive into chaos. So when and this is a deliberate technique that certain <coughs> managers will put their teams through when so there's a danger with experts that they become too uh, enamoured with a particular solution, right? uh, pattern in training. So. Um, the hammer next to, to the hammer expert, every problem looks like a nail. Um, so some executives will put a team of experts that have become too, too attached to a particular problem through a chaotic phase in order for them to develop new or novel processes or practices. So to answer your question to chaos, knowing you're going into chaos um, and being prepared for it, drilled for it. Um, an example that an example that's often stated is um, firemen or emergency response teams. Right, they're going into an inherently chaotic and random situation. The way they deal with it is by preparing for it and drilling, and drilling really hard, and, and being uh, prepared for them as many of them. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks, folks. Thanks. 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 Thanks.